Good evening and thank you for joining us for this discussion on bail reform. My name is Victor Boleg and I serve as the Racial Justice Program Manager here at the YWCA and I also serve on the board of the League of Women Voters as uh, incoming president and also chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee for the state. The League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson is an all-volunteer, nonpartisan activist organization that does not support or oppose political parties or candidates at any level of government. The mission is to empower voters, demand democracy, and encourage active, informed participation in government. We envision a democracy where every person has the desire, the right, the knowledge, and the confidence to participate and where every eligible citizen is registered and formed on all candidates and issues. And most importantly, that person votes. As an employee also of the YWCA, the Y has been leading the fight for social and economic justice in Southern Arizona since 1917. The YWCA's mission is to address racial and gender inequities through the various programs offered here at our main campus and at our sister locations, the House of Neighborly Services. Some of our programs include the Racial Justice Center, Rise Up, the Women's Business Center, Pathways for Single Moms, Pima County Teen Court, the Latina Leadership Institute, Las Comadritas, Your Sister's Closet, Why Works, and many more. The Racial Justice Center will be hosting a listening circle that will be geared towards folks that identify as women who have been impacted by the judicial system on November 21st at 4 p.m. This will be in partnership with the Arouette Foundation. Specific information pertaining to all of the programs available at the YWCA can be found on our website. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge some of our attendees who are present. We're fortunate and blessed to have representatives of the NAACP present in the audience. Current President Cherie Meeks, past presidents Doris Snowden and Donna Liggins. Thank you. Tonight's event will be broadcast live on Facebook on the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson and the YWCA of Southern Arizona's Facebook pages. Next, I'd like to bring Kate Vesely to the forefront and have us say something about Justice Services. Kate is the Director of Justice Services and works hand in hand with the Racial Justice Program with the YWCA. Kate Vesely. Justice Services is a relatively new department here in Pima County, and we really view ourselves as being a conduit to change. And so what that means is reaching into communities who historically have not had trust with government organizations to open up those doors and have difficult conversations with vulnerability and accountability. And so one of the many things that we're trying to do in partnership with the YWCA is really look at our justice system through that race equity lens and through <coughs> all aspects of the justice system. And bail reform in itself is so critical because not only is there large systemic issues when it comes to being held in custody while you're committing the crime, but there's also individualistic issues. The impact it makes on somebody's life to be held in custody, what it means to have that individual, but also their family and their children. And so I'm really excited and grateful to all the panelists up here to have this conversation. I'm personally a big fan of every single person up here, so I thank you very much for your time, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I hope you all, if you're interested in continuing this conversation, continuing the work of working with community and government to make positive change in our justice system, that you will communicate and reach out to us. We have a whole series of listening sessions that are going to be coming up. We have a community collaborative that's being hosted by my colleague Doyle Morrison in the back there. And so if you would be interested in participating in our community collaborative, participating in any of our future events, 
We want to hear from you. We are here to listen and learn and be a part of this community. So please, not only uh, would we love for you to come and sit at our table, but we would really love to come and sit at yours. So if you have events, uh, opportunities for us to learn more about what you're doing, please reach out to us. We would really like to invest in all of you as well. So thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you, our panelists. Thank you. I next want to move on to introducing our moderator. We're blessed to have a bilingual moderator tonight also. Myra Ramos is the Deputy Director of the Pima County Department of Justice Services. She has a Master's of Science in Health and Social Services with over a decade of experience in child behavioral health, primary care, adult mental health, and substance treatment and justice services in Tucson. She was part of the core development and launching of the Unified Medication Assisted Treatment Targeted Engagement Response, or You Matter program, the first of its kind in Arizona, which seeks to help people avoid jail and get into treatment for opiate abuse via deflection. She has served on the board of directors of the Liberty Partnership Keno Neighborhoods Council, better known as LPKNC and an active member of the Mexican-American Women's National Association, known as MANA, a national Latina organization. Mater is passionate, as a passionate practitioner in implementing quality improvement, system practices, and policy changes, evidence-based interventions, and other promising practices to address public health disparities and public safety. Without further ado, Myra Ramos. Thank you. Thank you all for being here this evening. As, Royal, as Victor shared, um, we appreciate your presence and the presence of such a high caliber panel of experts. Before we get started, I do want to set the mood with some ground rules in regards to our panel discussion this evening, which is intention is to elevate, highlight, and expand the work in regards to cash bail reform in Pima County. For that, we are going to allow each of the panelists to provide a response to the questions that have been created. If time permits, we will allow panelists to provide closing remarks for each of our questions. At the end of our time today, we do have formal time for um, participants Q&A. I would like to acknowledge and thank today um, Betsy Boja, um, the board member and co-chair of the Voter Services Rights with um, the League of Women Warriors of Greater Tucson for being our timekeeper today. She will be providing um, notifications for our panelists at the one minute mark and at the stop time. With that, um, being said, I think I can transition into the most important part of tonight, which is the actual moderating and introduction of our panelists. I will begin to the right with Dean Brault. Dean is the Director of Public Defense Services of Pima County. Public Defense Services supervises and provides administrative support to the Office of the Public Defender, Legal Defender, Legal Advocate, Office of Court Appointed Counsel, Mental Health Defender, Children's Counsel, and the Public Fiduciary. Mr. Brault got his start in 1997 working as a law clerk and bailiff for the Honorable John Davis, who was on the criminal bench of the Pima County Superior Court. He was then hired as a trial attorney at the Pima County Public Defender's Office serving for 18 years, the last three as a trial team supervisor. He then became the Pima County Legal Defender, heading the office for three years. Mr. Brault graduated from the University of Arizona College of Business and Public Administration which, with a Bachelor's of Science in Public Administration in 1993 and from the University of Arizona College of Law in 1996. He is currently the president of the Arizona Public Defenders Association, and he sits on the board of Arizona Supreme Court's Standing Committee on Pretrial Services and has been a member of multiple Supreme Court task forces. Tierra Rainey. Tierra is a proud second generation Tucsonan and has served as the executive director of the Tucson Second Chance Community Bail Fund since 2021. She received a bachelor's in anthropology from Vassar College and a master's in international affairs from George Washington University. A passionate abolitionist, Tierra spent four years as a lead organizer with the Black Lives Matter Tucson. 
She believes in black joy and liberation and is committed to cultivating both here in the Southwest. Amelia Craig Kramer is a member of the NAACP Tucson Branch Executive Committee. She has been nominated to serve as NAACP's Tucson Vice President for the next two years, and she chairs the Criminal Justice Committee. Ms. Kramer also is a member of the Social Justice Action Committee at the Reformed Jewish Congregation, Kol Ami. She is a retired attorney with a breadth of diverse experience, experience practicing law in Arizona, California, Massachusetts, and Washington, D.C. During her legal career, Ms. Kramer actively promoted civil rights as co-general counsel of the Arizona Civil Rights Union, as managing attorney of the Lombardo Legal Defense and Education Funds for Los Angeles office, and as executive director of the GLAD in Boston. During the latter part of her career, Ms. Kramer served for nearly 15 years as a reform-minded prosecutor in the position of Chief Deputy Pima County Attorney. Developing and implementing Pima County's drug treatment alternative to prison program, as well as other innovative programs, and serving as the county's representative with the MacArthur Foundation Safety and Justice Challenge. Ms. Kramer also worked for three large private law firms in Arizona, California, and Massachusetts, where she practiced commercial litigation and did pro bono work, providing free legal service for immigrants seeking asylum, people with HIV and AIDS, and prison inmates suffering from mental illness. Ms. Kramer is a former president of the State Bar of Arizona. She is a current member of the Arizona Minority Bar Association and serves on the Arizona Supreme Court's Task Force on Ethics for Government Lawyers. She is a graduate of the Dartmouth College and Stanford Law School. Our fourth panelist this evening is Tony Ruffin. Tony Ruffin is a former Marine who has worked as a research analyst and consultant for I Got Issues LLC, focusing on urban policy and equity. In 2020, he co-founded Pillars and Bridges of Tucson, a nonprofit organization dedicated to bridging, and div bridging the divide between city officials and, and the community they serve. Since that time, Tony has worked at the local and national level on policy reform, transforming 911 ECC operations, equity in schools, and has partnered with the Boys and Girls Club of Southern Arizona on a mentorship program. In addition to this work, he has also collaborated with other area nonprofits, local business, and city entities on various charity events, such as the Fresh Start Food Drives, Cobs and Kids Toy Drives, and many back to school events. Currently, Tony is continuing the process of making the 911 system equitable for all citizens. He has begun working with the Department of Justice Services to bring awareness and to evaluate the efficiency of programs put in place to lower jail population. Tony is a firm believer that where there is smoke, there is fire, meaning where there are disparities, there is also an opportunity for progress. With that being said, we will dive into our first question. We will, as mentioned, we'll allow, allow panelists to answer all questions. And I will begin with our first question, um, if I can have Mr. Dean Brault um, initiate the responses. Do you believe cash bail reform is necessary in Pima County? If so, why or why not? I do believe that bail <clears throat> reform is necessary in Pima County because we have far too many people that are in custody that are presumed to be innocent um, and are sitting there just waiting for their trial. And if they don't have money to be able to post their bond, they can't get out of jail. And, um, <clears throat> you know, an impact, people get impacted by being in jail um, in so many different ways, people lose their, their housing, they lose their jobs, they lose children if they are a single parent and don't have anybody else to take care of their kids. Um, the, the ripple effects of a person being unnecessarily incarcerated um, n impacts not only the individual, but families in our entire community. Um, and as an attorney, it's been exceptionally frustrating over my career to see people that should in every means be out of custody, and but f because a judge at an initial appearance um, at either 8 o'clock um, at the you know, mornings or evenings 
things are making a decision about whether or not somebody needs to be in custody or not, and then arbitrarily picks some figure that says you have to come up with these many dollars for you to be able to get out of custody is just wrong. You know, um, judges aren't making uh, determinations based upon whether a person can post that bail based upon the resources. They're just picking a number out of the blue that they think seems to be appropriate based upon what they're charged with. And that means that rich people get out of jail and poor people don't. Um, and that has a disparate impact on our minorities in Tucson, and it's something that we can do better by reforming. Um, I have a proposal um, that has been passed by the Board of uh, Supervisors in Pima County to create a community bond program that will seek to get everybody out of custody that is recommended to be got out of custody by pretrial services under the exact same conditions that were recommended um, with certain limits. Those limits are this person needs to be um, have a bond set of less than $30,000, they need to have a recommendation for release, they can't have any holds on them, and we're categorically excluding offenses that involve homicide, sex, and child exploitation charges. And if we can get things like this, this program up and running, we will get people out that my data shows we're getting out of custody anyway. It's just that it was taking them on average seven weeks to get out of custody. And as an attorney, I would often like have good news and bad news when I'd go out and meet with my in-custody clients, because we had a requirement that you would see your client within 48 hours of getting assigned the case. And I would often see the pretrial services reports that would say, hey, this person should be out of custody, but for some reason the judge decided, no, I'm going to disagree with that, the, that recommendation. I'm going to hold the person in custody. And when I would go out to the jail to see these people, I'd say, well, I've got some terrible news. You're in custody. But the great news is I'm going to be able to get you out of custody probably by filing a motion to try to get your conditions of release modified. But that takes almost a month if you're doing things as fast as you can. And I did things as fast as you could. And not all attorneys are as are as uh, diligent as that. So, you know, that's why there's an average of taking seven weeks for people to get out of custody. And could you imagine what would happen to your life if you were suddenly incarcerated for seven weeks, you're still presumed to be innocent, and but you've been plucked off the street and then thrown in the jail because you don't have the money to post the bond that's been imposed by a, a judge in your case. Um, you know, I think that we can we want to focus on trying to get the right people out of jail and as many people out as we can because I firmly believe in the presumption of innocence um, and that, that if a person does owe the state time, do it at the end if they get found guilty of what they've been charged with, not before. Thanks. Tara? Um, I feel like my pardon. You were told not to move the mics, but I think I have to get really close. Um, hi, everyone. Tierra Rainey. Um, in this is a pretty, it's, it's kind of funny because we're at a bail reform uh, conference, and I, I, I don't think anyone on this panel would say that they don't believe that cash bail reform should happen in uh, Pima County. So I will use this time to maybe um, emphasize maybe some of the difference in analysis. I, I completely agree with what Dean's saying in terms of uh, Pima County has way too many people sitting in uh, the jail. Most of them, 70 to 80 percent, are there pretrial, which means that they have not been convicted of a crime. Um, I do think the issue extends beyond cash bail, though. Um, and why that's important in this conversation is because I think some of the alternatives and visioning that is happening around how we reform pretrial uh, detention is still very punitive in lens. Um, I think it very much so relies on the expansion of surveillance, which has all sorts of consequences that, again, disproportionately impact black and brown people in particular. And really, I think we can't have this conversation about cash bail reform solely as though it can only happen in Pima County. We are part of a larger context and fabric. And I think that in terms of us really talking about how do we change the law, it's not going to just happen here in Pima County. It's going to happen at a state level. It's going to happen at the legislature. Um, and so with that said, I 
believe in this conversation. I believe in the need for these changes. Um, but most importantly, I believe that we need to stop penalizing people who have not been convicted of crimes. Um, I think a piece of this conversation that's also not necessarily captured in the, 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 the questions um, that we're going to be directly asked today is that we, I understand that in this moment, bail has, um, been blamed, I think, unfairly for a much broader context of what's happening in our community. Um, this conversation regarding bail and safety, I think, has been very disingenuous in many aspects. Um, and I can get into that further on. So all that to say, yes, I believe that we should have cash bail reform. Why? Um, because ultimately, I don't think that holding people who have not been convicted of a crime is actually in service of either the Constitution, and I don't really think it's um, creating the outcomes um, that this community says that it values. Thank you. I think you're next. Um, I absolutely believe that we need bail reform. I, I don't believe in money bail. I think that um, it criminalizes poverty and that that's an injustice and it's wrong. I think the way that bail is used in Pima County in particular is unconstitutional because I think that bail is imposed in a way in which it's excessive, knowingly excessive by some of the judges, intended to keep someone in pretrial detention. Bail was invented in the 1600s um, and the intent was for somebody to put a little skin in the game so they would maybe show up for their next court hearing um, while they're presumed innocent before they come to trial. And if they had a little skin in the game, they're more likely to show up to court and they're less likely to commit further crimes because that money would be taken away if they do. That's not how it works today. Um, we're using, you know, this hundreds of years old solution um, to a 21st century problem. Most people who are arrested suffer from mental illness and substance use disorder, more than two thirds. Um, most people who are arrested have not committed a violent crime. Most people who are arrested are not dangerous in the community. Bail is being imposed not in any way to have them put skin in the game so while they're on pretrial release, they won't commit further crimes and they'll show up to court. Bail is being imposed in Pima County to intentionally keep people in jail until the time of their trial, or for at least seven weeks. And it's done, I've heard law enforcement officers refer to it as jail therapy. Um, I've heard judges impose bail in the amount of $2,499 on a repeated basis. Why that particular number out of the blue? Well, I'll tell you why. Because at $2,500, a person can get a bond for 10% down. And they pay $250 and they're released. But $2,499, no bail bondsman will issue a bond, so they have to pay the full amount in cash. So that judge knows full well that person is not going to be able to pay that amount of bail. There's a study last year that showed most people in the United States do not have $400 to deal with an emergency, much less $2,499. So bail is being used in an unconstitutional fashion in this county and elsewhere throughout the state of Arizona and this country to purposely keep people in jail pretrial when they're presumed innocent who pose no public safety risk whatsoever. Now there are a few people who do pose a public safety risk. Murad Dervish, who just shot Professor Thomas Meissner on the University of Arizona campus. If any of you have read the now public police reports where there's dozens of pages explaining why he poses a public safety risk, not only to Professor Meixner, but to other professors, Professor Castro and others. He poses a public safety risk. Bail is not a good solution to keep him in jail because what if he finds a way to pay it? We had a situation that caused me to become passionate about money bail reform in 2014. In the same week, there was a man who was arrested after officers knocked and announced at his residence in the northwest area. It was either Marana or Oro Valley, I don't recall. He shot at them with a semi-automatic weapon through the door. Thankfully, they had bulletproof vests and were not killed. He was arrested for attempted murder on law enforcement officers. And bail was imposed, I forget if it was $150,000 or $250,000. But he was wealthy. He put up a mortgage on his house. He got the money and he got out on the street. That man posed a tremendous public safety risk. The same week, there was a woman who was arrested on a warrant because two years earlier, she had failed to show up in court for her court hearing. What was her underlying offense two years earlier? She had stolen a candy bar from a convenience store. 
This woman suffered from mental illness, gravely suffered from mental illness and substance use disorder. She spent 45 days in pretrial custody before she finally got a hearing because she was unable to post the amount of bail. We had it exactly backwards, where the dangerous guy is out of custody, free at large in the community, who's already committed a seriously violent gun crime and may commit another one, and someone who poses absolutely zero risk to anybody's physical safety is stuck in the jail. So yes, we need bail reform, and money is not the answer. We need to be making decisions about who is in pretrial custody, and we'll differ a little bit. I believe that pretrial custody should be used for a few people. Those like Jared Loeffner, Murad Dervish, um, the man who recently slaughtered a family um, after committing a series of violent domestic violence incidents and being arrested and getting out on pretrial release. A few people, uh, because of either um, the way that they were born and suffering from some brain disorder or because of mental illness, substance use disorder, and their actions pose a serious public safety risk and they should be held if certain evidence is found. Not just the regular probable cause, but there needs to be a high level of evidence found that they committed the crime of which they're charged and that they pose a physical safety risk to the community. Thank you, Mila. Pre-trial release should be determined by just three things. The nature of the crime, the, will the person be a threat to the community and will the person show up to court? A lot of the panelists here, you can hear they've, they've studied a lot of this. Try being the one sitting there for seven weeks because your driver's license was bad. You're sitting there and I would suggest anyone who's involved in this type of work, you actually go sit in on a few days of arraignments down at Superior Court because you will instantly see that there's a difference in who gets bail, who gets released OR, and who has to sit there. For a wealthy person, a million dollars bail is basically just a minor inconvenience. But for a person like me at the time, who was really struggling, it might as well have been a million dollars bail. I didn't have the $3,000. So when we consider what has to happen as far as cash bail is concerned, it's a much bigger picture than that. It's pre-trial release. All of the systems that allow a person to get out, OR releases, all of that plays a part. So what we have to really pay attention to is that no matter what we decide to do, whether we decide to get rid of bail altogether, whether we decide to reform what we have now, we have to consider the fact that these programs will still be administered by people and people still have biases. So whatever the program is, if there aren't mechanisms built in to ensure that everyone has equal access to that program, it doesn't matter how good it looks on paper. We're still going to end up with a higher minority population in our jails waiting for trial. So while I respect everyone here, I really think that everyone in this room should think about what we need to do. The people up here may be considered experts, but the people who are experts are your friends and family members who've actually gone through the system. Those are the people who need to be represented, and those are the people that I talk to every day because it's not necessarily what I may think because I have biases of my own. It's what they think. So when we move forward here with whatever we decide to talk about and whatever we decide to do, just keep in mind that the one piece that has to be in it is the one piece that's been missing ever since it got started, equity. This first question, even though very basic, it allowed us to create that level setting for everyone and our panelists to come to a speedy consensus of the need there is for cash bail reform in Pima County, whether it's because of this average of seven weeks that individuals are spending in our county jail or whether it's hurting our loved ones, our neighbors, our family members. 
There is also agreement in regards to the disproportionate impact it's having on minorities here in Pima County. However, the way we address and move forth varies a bit, which leads me to my second question. And Tiara, if you could be the first to respond. <laughs> what specific reforms are needed to the current cash bail system in Pima County? I was hoping to just sit back. Oh, and this um, is a very loaded yeah, question. Yeah, I, I was just gonna. If you, if you uh, yeah, um, I'll read through all of it. Tony's a hard act to follow. That was <laughs> very insightful. Thank you for that. Um, I think that. <laughs> I think it's funny because I was literally gonna be like, I don't have a per particular reform, and why is that? Um, why I'm not offering a particular reform is that I think we did not get here overnight um, in terms of how the system was created. Um, mass, we are the most incarcerated country in the world. I'm gonna say that one more time. The United States is the most incarcerated country in the world. And I think often we are told that we need easy black and white solutions to something that is incredibly nuanced and complicated. And that is the hard, painful truth about reform. There isn't a fast, easy solution to these problems. Ending cash bail does not change the racism embedded within the system. I think it might surprise people to understand that even though African Americans are only 5% of the population, we are three times overrepresented to 15% of those sitting at Pima County Jail. You don't even have to tell me. I see who comes through um, our community bail fund applications. I can tell you off the bat, black men, $10,000 bonds or higher, right? It's not just a matter of folks sitting on low level crimes in the jail, that's a very, small portion of the people sitting in Pima County Jail. The reality is most people who are sitting there are facing really complicated histories and they are complicated people. And guess what? Most of them need housing, they need support, they need treatment. Bail in and of itself is just one piece of equity. And I think that that's crucial when we're having this conversation. I believe in the work of the Tucson Second Chance Community Bail Fund, but I ultimately know that paying bail is not enough. It just isn't. Because people need support systems, people need community, people need food. And in terms of the rhetoric that has been, I think, very much focused on the increase in crime since 2020, we know for a fact that crime has not skyrocketed and that also during the time in which it skyrocketed, we had an increase in unemployment, we had an increase in instability. We were also isolated from one another for almost two and a half years. These things are a piece of a larger puzzle. Um, so. In all due respect, uh, although I know folks are very worried about homicides, most of the people that we are dealing with, these are folks who have committed crimes against Walmart, Safeway, facing multiple felonies for shoplifting, right? And it, that sounds simple and low level, but that's not how it's charged. People make, I think, a myriad of decisions, but often you ending up in the system has more to do with how you look, the presumption of innocence, and the presumption of criminality. And that in and of itself can't simply go away because we are changing bail practices. Because ultimately embedded within that is we need to create a community of care. And I think that that's very much so what we're ultimately arguing about when we talk about being abolitionists. I'm an abolitionist and I know that several folks up here are not, and that's okay. I don't expect everyone to believe that we should uh, abolish the prison industrial complex today. But as a starting point, I think we can recognize that pretrial detention in and of itself is punitive and it disproportionately captures black and brown people. And I think from there we build, how do we nourish our communities? How are we nourishing one another? And I can tell you keeping someone in jail for seven weeks, even we've had folks who've been in there for over a year, okay? Who have not been convicted of anything, right? But it's the story and the presumptions that we are trying to make as though we, we know 
who will commit a crime, who won't, based on charges alone, that's not sufficient to me. Thank you. Thank you. Amelia? Um, what we, we agree entirely that um, the prison industrial complex in the United States is a problem and the state is a problem um, and in our community here. Um, and I don't believe in a punitive criminal justice system. The state of Arizona, when it adopted its, its penal code back in the 1970s, expressly put into law that the purpose was to punish. Um, I don't believe in retribution. I don't believe in punishment. I believe in accountability, um, consequences, and I believe in public safety. But I think that we can achieve those things um, and restoration also um, in education and community, and we can achieve those things um, in a much more therapeutic environment because the, the, the jails are cages. Um, and nobody belongs in a cage. I don't care if they've committed murder. Uh, they don't belong in a cage. A human being does not belong in a cage. And so I think that what we need to do is look to places that have better environments, like uh, the Scandinavian countries, where uh, it's more like a college campus and there are therapeutic interventions that are provided in custody where people pose a public safety risk. And then those who don't pose a public safety risk, um, who've had an intervention because they have harmed another human being or a business which is made up of human beings um, and need to be held accountable and, and people may need to be protected from them. Domestic violence is the number one most prevalent crime. So we do need to potentially have an intervention and accountability, but there's a way to provide accountability and a therapeutic, transformative, restorative approach. So most of the people who are arrested and taken into the custody, in custody and jail, as I indicated, are, are suffering from mental illness and substance use disorder. Uh, many are suffering also from poverty um, and from trauma and from generational trauma. And there are tremendous racial and ethnic disparities that are increasing, which is a tragedy. It's already bad enough and it's going up. And, and what most people um, need is to get out of custody and have therapeutic interventions. Housing, transportation, uh, voluntary treatment available to them that they can avail themselves of. Um, Assistance with childcare, um, assistance with finding out about how the criminal justice system works and getting to court. Um, the same kinds of things that crime victims also need. And so I agree entirely that what we need to do is when there is an intervention to remove somebody from a situation in which they've harmed another person, and a third party, whether it's law enforcement or someone else, has to come in and do that. What we need to have is therapeutic, restorative interventions that will be preventative in nature. What we have right now is a system that increases recidivism. It causes people to commit more crimes. And the longer somebody sits in jail, the data shows, and we've got a report that you can pick up if you haven't already done so uh, from the NAACP on cash bail reform in Arizona, that provides the data and statistics indicating that we're making people worse, not better, by incarcerating them. So um, the specific reforms that are needed is ideally we would abolish money bail altogether. And we would focus instead on conditions of release from custody after someone's taken into custody. That would be therapeutic restorative interventions and motivators to get someone to come back for their next court hearing. And court hearings would be held at a time when a person's able to be there. And a per person who's accused of domestic violence would have housing. If they're not allowed to go home to their family because they've committed a crime there and they are not allowed to go back until their trial, they need to have a place to live. We need to provide that. They need transportation. Um, they probably need anger management counseling available to them not a year later after they're convicted, but right now. And so there are a lot of changes that we need, but what can we do from a practical standpoint here in Pima County right now? Well, there are a couple of things that we can do. Number one, we can advocate to the Pima County Board of Supervisors, the Tucson City Council, the Superior Court and the City Court that they change the way that they're handling bail hearings. There are judges that are in charge of these bail hearings um, pursuant to a contract um, that are not necessarily handling things in the right way. And the county and the city have the ability to make some changes. They can require them to collect data on who's being held in custody, who can't get out of jail for seven weeks, for seven days even, for one day because they can't pay bail. How much are people being required to pay? We don't even have those data. Um, and at the state level, we can change the law. We can impose legislation that says that nobody can have bail imposed if they've been charged only with a misdemeanor as opposed to a felony. We can change the law to say that 
the judge must find out whether someone has the ability to pay before they impose bail. We can change the law to require that the judge must consider implicit bias and historical implicit bias before they impose bail on a person and recognize the racial and ethnic disparities. And we have a specific proposal at the NAACP to do that, two specific statutes that would be modified. Um, there's copies of those on the table, so if you haven't already seen those, I urge you to take a look. Thank you. Well, I would really like to have a no, you know, no bail system. I focus my work usually on what we have now. And right now we have cash bail. One of the things that I think really needs to change immediately is the fact that priors are used to help determine whether someone can get bail or released. When we know that the majority of the priors that people have actually came from years of over-incarceration. So to use those now when you're considering someone 10, 15 years later, you're actually victimizing them a second time. So if you really want to you know, think about the things that need to happen to change the bail system, you have to always go back to the human element. These programs are being administered by human beings. You have to make sure that there are set parameters that decide whether someone can be released that aren't up to the discretion of a judge or a prosecutor or someone else. Because as long as they can say, well, no, I don't like him, or go into a corner, or do whatever they want to do, have their little conversations, and then come back out and say, no bail or a huge bail, then we're going to keep having the same problems. We're going to have a higher minority population in the jails and prisons. People forget that the people who are in jail today are going to be the people who are in our prisons tomorrow. And those people sitting there watching people that have done crimes that are twice as bad as them just go home. Every day, they're watching people go home. When they get out, they're going to have a chip on their shoulder that you would not believe. And that's one of the main reasons why our recidivism rates are, are so high. These people get out of jail, and I know for a fact, because like I said, I was one of them. I, get out, I got out of jail, and I was really like not someone to deal with. If I felt that you were putting me in a position where I'm going to go back to jail, then I'm going to make sure that I make it worth it. That is not what we want in our society. So if we can show more equity by getting rid of some of the little extras, by getting rid of some of the discretion that these different people have for the same types of situations, people will start seeing, OK, well, they didn't treat me worse than they treated someone else. Maybe then we can get people to start doing what I had to eventually do and start looking at myself. If I'm getting treated just like someone else, then maybe it is me. And that's when people can start healing and start actually uh, really living up to their potential. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before I get into answering the question, I wanted to go back to the seven weeks that, that we've talked about. Um, the seven weeks that I was talking about is for how long it takes for people that were already getting released to get out. There are lots and lots of clients that are in much longer because they don't get out. They don't get a successful motion filed, or there's not a recommendation for release, and or there's no, or you know, they just can't post the bail. And on average, cases last months. You know, it's like five and a half, four and a half months is the average disposition time of a case. And there are many that go on for years. So you need to keep that in mind when we're talking about the impact on, on people's lives. What specific reforms are needed for the current cash bail system in Pima County? I would say one of the problems that we've had with, with my proposal is that we've had two or RFPs that have gone out to try to get community to um, agencies to bid on providing the services. Unfortunately, we have not had any takers on that yet that have qualified to provide those services. So that's an obstacle that we're dealing with. We're maybe going to refine the approach that we're doing uh, and potentially bring that 
bring a new proposal that uh, that one of our supervisors has asked for for contemplating potentially being able to do this in-house within Pima County. Um, you know, the overall obstacles. You know, all of the a lot of the other proposals are for big picture. How do we completely reform the entire cash bail system? My proposal is to think small. Let's think of what we can do that's in our control right now as Pima County, and that is the community bond program that I've got proposed. The nice thing about that is we don't have to overcome some of the larger obstacles like getting, you know, getting votes to change state statutes and the Arizona Constitution. It's got a provision in there, Article 2, Section 22, that says that there is a right to bail. Um, it, and, and, and with certain exceptions, only one of which at this point I believe is being been deemed uncon or been deemed constitutional, which is for people that um, have committed offense while they're on release for another offense. Um, so my objective at this point is to try to accomplish what we can now and work on the bigger other picture, bigger picture items later and see what we can do in terms of, of things. But let's get the people out of jail now um, while we can. Um, the, uh, the, uh, you know, there are lots of obstacles towards, you know, towards, you know, getting a lot of the, the, the bigger picture statutory changes done. It's a lot of politics. I've dealt with the political system way too much in my current job. And getting the state legislature to do anything, especially to amend the Arizona Constitution, is going to be a heavy lift. But my, my goal right now is to try to do what we can with the time that we've got and, and make the changes that are in the control of Pima County. Thank you. It goes with our saying that we're rather blessed here in Pima County with having such passionate, dedicated, and solution-oriented um, leaders in our community. Um, from sharing and establishing continuum of care, reforming the pretrial detention, examining the bail hearings, and developing restorative, um, therapeutic restorative interventions, all sound um, like forward thinking and innovative ideas. Amelia, if I can have you answer this third question. All these um, solutions, how can, we best how can we best achieve each of the identified reforms? How do we get from our current problem to that solution? Well, we're currently thinking, I think, um, only short term. And when I say we, I mean the people that are responsible for running the system. And we're spending more money than we need to. So if we want to have therapeutic interventions like providing housing, um, providing transportation, um, providing the availability of treatment out in the community for people who are on pretrial release, um, that all costs a lot less money than incarcerating them in the jail. Um, and local taxpayer dollars are going to pay for the jail in Pima County, whereas Medicaid is available um, throughout with, with United States taxpayer dollars to pay for any treatment needs that exist in the community for mental health, behavioral health, as well as medical care. So we're actually um, being you know, penny wise and pound foolish by not being willing to think outside the box and spend money because if we spend a little bit of money to provide these therapeutic interventions in the community for people on pretrial release, we will save a lot of money in the jail. Um, we've had the judge who's in charge of the group of judges who handle bail hearings here in Pima County, which are called initial appearances. They occur at, at a courtroom in the jail um, we've had the presiding judge from Tucson City Court who handles all the bail hearings, not just for Tucson City Court misdemeanors, but also for Pima County Superior Court felony cases, as well as for Pima County Justice Court, um, Sarita, South Tucson, um, Marana, Oro Valley Town Courts. Um, th that judge who presides there said, well, I would use these alternatives, um, but th I, there's just not a program in place. Well, let's get a program in place. Um, let's have the city council and the board of supervisors demand that these courts, pretrial services, the sheriff's department, law enforcement, uh, the, their health departments, behavioral health departments, get a program in place. That's something they have absolute control over. Our sheriff doesn't want as many people in his jail as he has. He's supporting the NAACP proposed legislation and wants other solutions because he says for the few people who may pose a public safety risk because they've committed domestic violence and have been demonstrated to be at high risk and high propensity to commit it again based on a lethality assessment in the near future or someone who has committed 
multiple uh, DUI offenses who may be very likely to drive intoxicated, currently those people are being detained in jail because there are bail amounts that are imposed that they cannot pay. Those are folks who may need some supervision in the community to make the community safe, but it can be minimal. A lot of them um, could have, you know, a, a once a day check in with a breathalyzer um, and have a curfew where they have to be at home at night and can't be driving. They can go to work. They can go to pick their kids up at school, go to the grocery store, go to their religious institution. Um, if someone has committed domestic violence, even if they pose a significant risk, there's electronic monitoring with geofencing. The person does not need to be in a cage in the jail. They can be out in the community keeping their job, seeing their kids, going to the grocery store, going to their religious institution, supporting the family still, um, rather than what the situation is what we have now, which is people who suffer from substance use disorder, uh, whether it's drug addiction, alcoholism, the combination, mental health disorders, are being traumatized in the jail and made worse. So what we need to do is we need the leaders of the city council, the board of supervisors, and our courts to get together with our sheriff, collect the data about how many people are stuck in the jail that we could safely allow out into the community, and it's most of them. What conditions do they need for their therapeutic restoration as well as to keep the community safe? And let's pay for those which would be cheaper than keeping them in the jail. So we have the ability to do that now, and I see the bail fund as a quick solution that is a good solution, but it's a Band-Aid when we're hemorrhaging. It's not a permanent long-term solution, and we, we need to walk and chew gum at the same time. We need to both do the short-term solution of a bail fund, and we need to push for legislation. And the NAACP proposal this year is not a constitutional amendment. It's to change two statutes, which could be done by the legislature. I'm an eternal optimist. I used to work on same-sex marriage. I'm now married to my wife. I believe that things can change, okay, in this country. And if we're all people who can make change happen in this room. So I urge you to support these legislative proposals because if we don't get behind them, they sure aren't going to happen, and support the bail fund at the same time. Thank you. Tony. Uh, how can we best achieve the identified reforms? Um, I believe that's by relying on the most powerful people here in Tucson, the community. We have to get together what we actually want to do, like people in this panel, we need to get in a room and we need to actually decide on what we're going to do. Put it in front of the people and find out whether they support it. And if they don't support it, let's figure out what changes we need to make. And then at that point, we make it an issue that you know people will vote on. Because one thing I do know from the work that I've been doing over the past few years, the one thing that scares a politician is not being a politician anymore. And we're the only ones who can actually make that happen. So if we improve our outreach and information to this community, then the community will let us know exactly what changes we need to make. It'll be a, it'll, it'll be a lot easier when we have every voice in the room instead of the constant back and forth bickering, you know, this kind of thing, politics or whatever the case may be. This is a public safety issue. You know, I happen to be one of the people who really do believe that there are some people that belong in jail. I really do believe that. I have two grown daughters that live in this city and I've gone across town to scare people away from their apartment. So whether they may have mental health issues or drug addiction issues, if we're not doing things to make sure people get the treatment they need, because right now, all treatment is voluntary. You know, coming from Los Angeles, growing up in the 80s, where I basically had drug addiction all around me, I know for a fact that it does no one any good to have them go to jail, come back in the same position, still addicted. If we can't actually do some things to make people get off of drugs, then we're just actually kicking the can down the road. These are much bigger issues and they are gonna take some hard conversations and some hard decisions. When I was a kid, my mother and father told me, Tough love is what you're going to get. When we're talking about things like this, like bail and other things like this, how many times are we going to have to release the same person out of jail, 
before we decide, okay, well maybe you need to go sit down for a little while. So just because I believe that these things need to happen and that, and that there is disparity, I also believe that we have to make public safety the main priority. No one in here wants to run into someone who really doesn't have very good intentions in the middle of the night, getting out of your car, going in your house. So when we really talk about what we need to do and how can we actually achieve the reforms and have the type of city that we want, we have to take it to the people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how can we best achieve the uh, identified reforms? I think data is essential. Data drives decisions. Data drives politicians. Data shows when things are working and shows when things are not working. Um, and we are currently working on, um, I'm a member of many task force within Pima County to try to solve our data problems. And it's not an easy problem to fix. I mean, you know, we, we need to be able to identify who's in jail, which means we're going to need cooperation from the Sheriff's Department because they're the ones that can tell us who's in jail and how long they've been there and whether they've been able to post their bond or not. We need cooperation from pretrial services and the Superior Court and the City Court. And we need, to, we need to get a whole bunch of people to the same table so that we can identify, you know, who is in jail. Because as the Director of Public Defense Services, you know, I, I, I represent everybody in Pima County that's been charged with a felony for the most part, you know, except for the people that have, can afford private representation. But even that doesn't solve the whole picture because there are lots of people that aren't entitled to representation. Those people are in jail for misdemeanors and we don't know how long they're there. We don't know how their cases are resolved. So we need to get a better grip on getting identifying the data and knowing why are these people here and what can we do to prevent them from being in jail for as long as they are or for even in the first place being in jail. Um, I don't believe that trying to force the court to do that by um, holding an IGA over their head um, about, how, about dealing with um, initial appearances is the right way to go. They've already pretty clearly indicated that they're not going to be forced to do anything. If they're going to do something, they need to think it's a good idea and do it on their own. So I think that we need, we've got a lot of work to do by persuading the court to get to the, the, the point where we need to get. And I think that the discussions I've had with, with court leadership, um, that they're generally in agreement that we want to be able to identify the people that are in jail and why they're there. Um, it's just a matter of how do we do it. Um, and uh, I think that that getting cooperation amongst all the agencies so that we can take a hard look at the, at the information is going to get us where we need to go. So I think that's my best answer for what can we do to, to achieve our goals is track the data. Thank you. Um, I think I just wanted to start off by saying we are definitely a Band-Aid. <laughs> I'm like, I should get that on a t-shirt. Uh, we, I would say the bail fund has never purported to be the solution and we do not want to be in business in 10 years or 20 years, but we're also abolitionists in Arizona. So I think that the reality is anyone who's selling you a quick fix is just not being honest, right? Because the reality is to have the sort of future where we're actually going to fundamentally change pretrial services and pretrial detention in this state, it's going to take decades, right, of work. We are one of two states that still has a truth in sentencing law from 1990, I think, three or two that is still in place. It's only Arizona and Florida that is a huge reason why we are one of the most incarcerated states in the country. The fact that we haven't been able to reform that in any substantive way should be an indicator for the public about the appetite of our legislature and fundamentally tackling our very broken system. Some of this is about the legacy of Arizona. Um, it's not lost on me that Florence, for example, is a city that literally runs on prisons on top of former cotton fields, right? So that is Arizona. 
That is the state that we live in, and we have to be critically honest about that if we're engaging in these conversations. And I think that we are proud of the fact that we are planting seeds. We never said that we are gonna see the fruition of our labor in this lifetime. I don't fight or, or dream because I want a particular legislative win. I fight and dream for black folks in Arizona. I want us to be free. And I know that we are disproportionately not just held in Pima County Jail, we are disproportionately incarcerated in every carceral system in this country. That is not a coincidence, that is not an accident, that is by intention. And so when we talk about alternatives, for example, saying that ankle monitors, home detention is the future of a progressive incarceration for these folks being held pretrial. What I want to emphasize is that these are not light technologies. They are highly fallible. They are very inconvenient. And again, we are punishing people who have not been convicted of a crime. This is just giving the illusion of security. Right. Um, I think a number that's also important to bring up, I believe the sheriff's annual budget is somewhere around 250, 300 million dollars a year. The city of Tucson is dedicating how much? Two million dollars to affordable housing. We know our community is in crisis. Part of this uptick of, in particular, petty crime is highly linked to the deeper to the deeper ails that are that are impacting people because of poverty, right? And so cash bail, again, it's honestly some of the smallest issues that people are dealing with. When, when you're talking about fighting a case, having the ability to still work, to keep your kids, to have your apartment, to also be making it to court if you don't have reliable transportation, et cetera. There are lots of barriers that are making it impossible for people to get free. And I think that that's one of the most heartbreaking pieces of our work, because it's not that, I mean, the vast majority of people that come to us, we can't help them, right? Because they need $10,000, $20,000, $30,000. We are not a bond fund. We are a community bail fund, meaning that we solely function off of donations and grants in order to provide free bail relief. The bail industry is a multi-billion dollar industry for profit, right? That's profiting off of the suffering of these families. But that is just one step. That is one step in all of the barriers someone has in fighting their case and staying out. And I think the last piece I want to say is we also need to acknowledge that prosecutors use the fact that the pretrial detention is as high as it is as leverage to make people take much harsher plea deals, right? And so that's also a system design. And again, I think we have to think um, more broadly. We have to continue to be visionaries. And I, I'm all about being an optimist. And in that world, I know that I'm not going to see the, the fruits of my labor today. And I'm committed to that either way. Thank you. Thank you. So we've heard our panelists express the need for multi-system, multi-faceted, deep fundamental change, highlighting some of the things, including data-driven decisions, public safety, addressing barriers, and root causes. However, there has also been a very important call to action in regards to community support at a legislative level and um, community outreach. With that, I will turn over the mic to Victor for audience questions. Chair, I'm so glad that you brought up uh, the bail bond entity, the machine, because one of the things we've been researching, the bail bonds and how that works in the community, you started looking into what goes into, if you went to one of these bail agents, what it entails to get um, somebody to post, and it's not just a matter of putting up 10% collateral. You have to pay so much in monthly fees. You, if, let's say you gave a piece of property like a car as collateral. Not only do they charge you to uh, the pr privilege of holding onto your vehicle, they charge you every month to hold onto your collateral, but they charge all sorts of fines and fees and all these things on top of it. And so it really hit home for us on our department when we were researching all of this 
to even, if you have the amount of, uh, you know, a house or a car or something to serve as collateral, how much you still have to pay on top of that. So I'm hoping the panel can talk a little bit about uh, the impact and the, uh, the persuasion of, of the, the business aspects of uh, incarceration and how much uh, that plays a role in what the policy decisions and uh, certainly locally but also on our state level. Um, I guess I can start with that. Um, yeah, fines and fees are a serious problem. Um, and ultimately, it's a private industry, so they can kind of do whatever they want in terms of the contracts that they're implementing with families. We have definitely bailed out people who have been returned to jail for lack of payment. You know who loves electronic monitoring? Bail bondsmen. It's one of the ways that they, it's an alternative if you can't come up with collateral. And we've had people return to jail because they could not keep up with the, the, the weekly, monthly fees of the electronic monitoring programs being run by the bail bondsmen. So it is a very extractive relationship. We've been contacted by parents um, in panic because, say, their kid missed court um, for what might be a very relatively small bond, $5,000, $4,000, they put up their house. And the bail bondsmen are threatening to sell their home right, for a $4,000 or $5,000 debt. And there is very little regulation. There is very little recourse once you've executed that contract and signed over that collateral. And I think, again, at the heart of that is the desperation and exploitation that happens because people are trying to get home because they recognize that they have other obligations. It's, it's very traumatic. Um, and honestly, it's, it's, I wish there was more that we could do. As an attorney, um, one of the things that I would see was be like people that were able to post bonds with, with commercial bonding agents would have all kinds of other fines and fees, like they would have mandatory drug testing, the, the GPS monitoring. Um, and so um, and another frustrating thing is that they've got no incentive to, to to not have the bond forfeited because they get the bond forfeited, they've got the collateral to cover the the, the amount of it, and they're getting they're making their ten percent whether or not they get released or not. And if they get released or if they get if they get their bond forfeited and they get held, they've got an opportunity to post another bond and then earn them some more money. So it's a it's a it's an ugly business, um, and it's. I agree that it is one of those relics from history that I don't know how we got here, but the fact that we are the only, I think, nation in the world that has a commercial industry based upon incarcerating people and, and getting them released based upon monetary bond. You know, we're talking about um, bail bonds, but I will just point out that the part of the reason why we have the large prison industrial complex in the state is we have a governor who ran for office and was elected um, with a lot of money that came in from the private prison system. And so similarly, last year when the NAACP of Arizona did seek a constitutional amendment in the state legislature and had a hearing in the Judiciary Committee, um, the, who showed up to talk against it, um, supported by uh, then Representative Mark Fincham, uh, who just lost his uh, election for Secretary of State and is one of the Oath Keepers, but a bail bonds industry leader. Um, and that that's who's primarily in opposition to bail reform in the state. And so we are up against a lot. But the NAACP proposal um, does a couple of things. One is rather than eliminate bail altogether, it does it for misdemeanors only. Why? Because we think we may be able to get that incremental change. And it's a partial Band-Aid, but we need Band-Aids in the interim. And secondly, the proposal would prevent, if there is electronic monitoring or any other costly service that a uh, person on pretrial release is required to utilize, they would not be allowed to be charged for it because that is absolutely, um, it, I don't have time to go through the whole, you know, um, book The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander or the movie 13th, but this is basically um, indentured servitude that is uh, in the guise of public safety and the criminal justice system. Um, so we need, you know, w with one point you made, um, Sometimes people do need to be forced into mental health or substance use treatment. I'm in recovery for 39 years. I, I understand addiction. And I think that we don't need the criminal justice system to do that. We have a civil legal system that could do that. We do that for mental illness, for people who are in crisis. But why don't we do that for people who have 
chronic issues and substance use disorder because we can require people to get into treatment for that brief period of time it takes for the brain to get clear enough to say, oh, I want this for myself. And so rather than criminalizing um, drug possession and addiction, we need to decriminalize that and move into a therapeutic system. And if somebody needs to be required into treatment, we need to do that civilly. Why does a person need a criminal record because they're sick? I mean, that system is sick. Well, I'm actually glad you brought that up because when I talk to, you know, I get a bunch of people together and we're sitting around, uh, they call that entire process, they say it's worse than payday loans, 10 times worse than payday loans. I mean, if you really want to talk about predatory, that's the epitome. Because as some of the other panelists were saying, with the other things that you have to do, and you still have to deal with your responsibilities with your family, you still have to work, you still have to deal with people showing up at your job. I mean, you're really set up to fail. And when we say fail, we're not just talking about them taking your collateral. We're talking about them actually returning you to jail. Every time a person goes to jail, no matter how long it's for, you're starting over again. You know, I know people that are older than me, and I'm pretty old, as you can see from my face, and they're starting over less than a month, just now getting out, 10, 20 years, absolutely nothing. I mean, these people, they can barely ride on the bus all day, but they have to take the bus all the way from the south side to go to their PO way up on Grant. Now, when that's the situation, and then you add the extra financial burdens and things like that, is it any wonder why so many people give up? And, you know, you just spoke about, you know, the mental health aspects and the drug addiction aspects. A lot of the things that we're talking about right now, they're not in existence. If you really want to get into what I want to do, I want a separate facility for those types of people, a medical facility. The only thing is, I don't want people to be able to walk away from it voluntarily. I have family members that when they walked away, the only reason why they went back is because it was a few of us, my brothers and cousins and stuff like that. We met them outside and we told them, you come out here, they turned around and went back in. 20 years clean. You have to actually give people an opportunity to make it. And those that really take advantage of the opportunity but decide they want to leave and things like that because they know they can come back again and again and again, well, like I said, how many times do we have to give you the not, an opportunity to clean yourself up? You know, that's a lot of money that we spend as a country on these types of things. And there has to be a certain amount of personal responsibility in this. It's not our job, or it's not the community's job to help people stay in the situation that they're in. So like I said, these are some hard conversations that we're going to have to actually have as a community, but they all have to start from the same set of facts. We have problems in this community that need to be solved. And, and the longer we run from them, just because they may not be politically popular or, you know, f for me, someone like me to be standing up here saying, hey, look, there are some people that belong in jail. What do you think it's going to be like for me the next time I roll up to Rodeo Park? I'm going to have to explain that. But the people at Rodeo Park, they already know there are some people who belong in jail. So we can't be scared to, to say what really needs to happen here. And we can't be scared to say, you're going to have to meet us halfway if you really want some help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have time for one other question. And then the gentleman. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Carlin. I use the pronoun. And I uh, 
I work with the building. And so my question is, and this is something, like to be like full transparency, this is actually something that Tara and I have touched on before, and it's something that I want So I think that I remember hearing something that was saying that actually the most amount of crime that happens in the United States is white collar crime, and it almost never gets punished, right? So I'm in my 30s, and I have lived through now, we're uh, through I think like two recessions, one of them happened immediately after I graduated from high school, the recession of 2008 that was orchestrated by by uh, an entire industry of people and nothing happened, right? So when we're talking about why we feel like we need to fixate on violent crime, what do we also mean by violent? Because to me, an industry having the ability, groups of people having the ability to destroy an entire economy, to destabilize an entire country, to fuck up an entire generation's ability for mobility, that is criminal, that is violent. That is destabilizing, but we're not talking about white crime. We are not talking about white collar crime. Most of those people will never see the inside of a jail cell. And, and we even as a nation do not comprehend that white collar crimes, like right, stealing people's money, stealing people's labor, stealing people's homes as violent, but when but we say, oh, but like people responding to things like poverty, people responding to things like systemic racism, um, that is violent, right? The other piece that I'm curious about too is, we need to be honest about the fact that we, we actually are not a nation of accountability. We don't know how to be accountable, we know how to be retributive, but we don't actually have values of accountability because if we did, Again, we would talk about white collar crime in the same way that we talk about people committing murder, and we don't. And so my question is, what do you all make of that, right? How do we shift and have an honest conversation about why we talk about crime, and we talk about violent crime, which is racially coded in the way that we do, and we don't have the same time and energy or conversation about the large systemic almost like unapologetically transparent ways that like white collar crime happens in our country and no one is ever held accountable for it. Yeah, I definitely want to jump in on that one, like right away. <laughs> right now we're watching a man who posted a bail, went to court, was found guilty in court, and he's still running around free on that same bail awaiting an appeal. Do you honestly believe that that would happen whether it was you or me? When we talk about what is crime, I consider crime anything that affects another person, in my opinion. So to really to answer your question, it's on us to actually complain about it. Yes, I understand that complaining really, you know, it's like sitting in a rocking chair, it gives you something to do, but it don't get you nowhere. I get that. But if we run around and cause problems, create all kinds of havoc, then we become the story, not the issue we're talking about. You see, during the unrest here in 2020, I was the one who was actually standing in between the protesters, the police, and the counter protesters trying to keep the protesters moving. Why? Because the, the counter protesters and maybe some police really wanted an opportunity to talk about anything other than the situation. We were out there to talk about police violence. And it ended up being a conversation about all those people who ran on the freeway. See, for, for those of us that are actually working to try to make change, we get tired of actually having to beat this back for the first 45 minutes of an hour conversation. So 
when you're talking about what are we supposed to do about those types of things, number one, we're supposed to bring attention to it. Then number two, we are actually supposed to vote on it. We're supposed to actually get together and we're supposed to come up with good candidates and we're supposed to put those candidates in once those candidates have already decided that they are going to support the things we're talking about. We can't keep giving our votes away for free. And that's the bottom line. And then we, we also can't sit back and protest vote. Because if we sit back and we withhold our vote, then guess what? The people that are in opposition to what we want, that makes it a lot easier for them. So if, if we really want to do something about the situation that we have in place, then that means we actually have to act. We can't sit back and we can't just react. Thank you. For time purposes, we'll move on to our final question. Um, you mentioned Scandinavia. You mentioned Scandinavia, um, and of course they have no guns and no private business. But I believe there are some instances or some models where some states have actually had a diversion program to save money um, rather than incarcerate people. And do you know where they are in the U.S.? And has it happened here? I can. And there are multiple diversion programs here. So both the um, the county prosecutor's office and um, the city prosecutor's office, as well as some of the courts, have multiple diversion programs. One of the great programs here is the Tucson Police Department's deflection program, where someone avoids arrest altogether. And then there are multiple diversion programs for people who've been arrested, sometimes pre-indictment diversion, sometimes post-indictment diversion. Those exist. They're good. This is a community that has been at the forefront of diversion. But that is not solving the problem, because we have people that are being taken into jail. They're eligible for a diversion program, but they're sitting there for weeks before they get to go out into the community to begin engaging in the diversion program. And so it's one of the problems. And to, to their point that about, I mean, I couldn't agree more with the comments about the, the what do we treat as crime and, and white collar crime needs to be given a lot more attention. And it's, a, it's a, something with a mass casualties of victims rather than just individual victims. Um, you know, I, I also think that, um, we, I just lost my train of thought. Anyway, I just wanted to say I entirely agree with what they had to say. <laughs> and to follow up on what Ms. Kramer said, is that I worked with her very closely to come up with a new uh, diversion program called STEPS, where the whole purpose of STEPS is to take people that are charged with drug offenses and encourage them to get involved with treatment. And if they do, reward that by dismissing the charges. Because we want to, we want to take... The, the criminal justice system and use that opportunity to get them directed in the right way. And once they are engaging in treatment and doing what they need to do to at least learn what they need to do to help themselves and whether it sticks on that time or not, we're willing to take that chance. But once they get engaged with treatment, start treating that allegation of possession of drugs, not as a criminal offense, but as a behavioral health problem. And say, you've earned the right to, to keep on with your treatment and, and, and learn from what, you've, what you're doing. And that's one of our primary goals is to have an elevated series of, of, deflect, of diversion and deflection programs so that we've got a spectrum of things to deal with crimes other than having people get convicted of offenses. Uh, oh, sorry. Can I chime in? Um, I always, I love when people talk about the Scandinavian model because I, I like to bring up the rapper ASAP Rocky. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Um, he was incarcerated in a Swedish jail for over a month, right? For Because he was accused, his bodyguard actually was accused of assaulting someone and he was held. And I don't think that is also a surprise as he is a black man, even though he was in Scandinavia, right? Anti-blackness is global, and I think that these are things that, in terms of the Scandinavian model, I really want to push back on, like, this idea that you can just have this, like, IKEA jail, and, like, this is utopia. It's not 
fully utopia. Aesop Rocky would fully disagree with he was not happy being in that IKEA jail, even if it was uh, progressive, right? Because at the end of the day, it was still a cage. And I want to hold that. Like, they are still caging people, even if it is a more progressive, quote, humane model, it is still a cage, right? Um, so that was all I wanted to add to that. Thank you. And at this time, unfortunately, we have to move on to closing remarks. So if each of you um, are provided five minutes to highlight um, what your organization will continue to work on concerning the issue of bail reform, how individuals and community can support these efforts, add anything that we might have missed, and all the questions. If we can start with um, Tony. Well, Pillars and Bridges is going to keep bringing everything we get directly to the community. The programs that they spoke about here, I actually want them. I want them all. That way I can look them over and I can actually sit down with people in different situations and see what they think about them. The first thing that I always ask, just like I ask Justice Services, is for better information. Because like they were just talking about the STEPS program. Well, I need to know who's being referred to those programs, broken down by race, gender, and age. So if I don't have that type of information, how can I tell if that program is working or where it needs to be changed? That's the main thing that Pillars and Bridges is going to do to continue with this type of work. We're not, a we're not the type of group that will come out to a meeting and then that's it. We follow up. And that's the reason why I went from just a guy running around in my old car talking to people to a person who got a chance to interview the mayor when they were running as a candidate. Because the people are the ones who actually support the work I'm doing. I'm not as concerned about, as you would say, the click. I'm about the people. That's why many of you have never seen me before. Some of you know that I've been around here for years because I'm out here talking to the people. And look us up at pillarsandbridges.org. Give us any support that you may want to give us. Come on out and actually roll out with us. I guarantee you'll have a lot of fun. I mean, we were just at a, a cook-off that you would not believe. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Shree Meeks could tell you about that. She was out there. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to continue to, to engage the community and bring what the community is saying to city officials like the ones that are here on the panel. So I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. Dean? Thank you. Um, Public Defense Services is going to continue to have the nose to the grindstone and grind out the community bond program that we've been, it's been a project of mine for, you know, four years now, of the last two of which have been frustrating because we've gotten approval by the Board of Supervisors and haven't been able to get the program up and running yet. But we are going to maybe take a, a new approach at things. I'm going to work with Ms. Vesley to try to come up with some suggestions for the county to um, maybe change course a little bit and look at doing this internally so that we can get a program up and running that does involve using our community's funds to get our people out of jail that don't need to be in jail in the first place. So it's going to be a, a, a long slog, and I'm looking forward to um, seeing that program come to fruition. But all of the other goals of trying to deal with the bigger picture of what is bond and do we really still need it are a bigger picture item that need to be you know, pursued with diligence, and it's going to take a very, very long time. And what can, what can the community do? I've got one word for you. Vote. Vote, vote, vote. Um, all of the, the bigger picture things are going to require support from politicians. And you need to vote and you need to make your vote known to them and know what, let them know what you want so that, that when they decide whether they're going to be in support of this or be opposing it, 
We need to make sure that, that, that reforming our criminal justice system and how we hold people in jail is a top priority. So make, your, make the people that you vote for aware of what you want to see and the reforms that you want to see. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't bring up that the Tucson Second Chance Community Bail Fund was founded by my mother, Lola Rainey, um, who is the first generation Tucsonan, and I am the second. Um, and we have a deep commitment to this place, um, this place that often does not, I think, even acknowledge the presence of a ongoing multi-generational black community that is vibrant, um, that has been here for a very long time. And the work of the Tucson Second Chance Community Bail Fund is I think upholding a black abolitionist vision um, for our community. We are not the only abolitionist organization in this community. Um, and I think that really are in terms of like the future work. Um, of course, we're going to continue bailing out people. Um, but beyond that, that's not all the bail fund is. We are an advocacy organization. We have community workshops. We just had a workshop on dreaming abolitionist futures. Um, I think often when it comes to these conversations about um, us being impractical, right, or abolitionists are impractical. Um, this is why we create these spaces. Um, it's showing up to panels like this and knowing that maybe no one agrees with our vision, but we hold steady um, knowing that there are seeds that are planted, that there are shifts that are made. Um, and that's really, I think, at the heart of our work is, is building not just coalition and organizing in response to the system, but also really, I think, cultivating creativity, um, cultivating black leadership, and really continuing to prioritize the most marginalized people within a criminal legal system that did not sprout up overnight. Um, that is really the legacy of generations of oppression. And I am heartened and excited about continuing the work and being in touch and in community with you all. And if you choose to be a monthly donor, that's great. Um, we also do a holiday commissary fund in December where we um, put money on the books of twenty five dollars uh, in the books of about between 100 and 150 folks who are detained in Pima County Jail um, for Christmas um, for the holidays. Given that we know that the vast majority of people that we want to help, we can't help because of just the large and insurmountable amount of bail that is being asked for a lot of people there. There's a lot of juveniles being charged as adults. There's a lot of disturbing things happening at Pima County Jail. And I'm really glad that there are people in community who are concerned about it, that want to see changes, that want to see liberation. And um, you can find us on Instagram at Tucson Bail Fund um, or find more about find out more about our organization at www.tucsonbailfund.org. Thank you. So the NAACP um, is the nation's oldest uh, civil rights organization, and we're uh, here 113 years old. Um, we seek racial equity and justice. Um, that's our purpose, and particularly focusing on black, indigenous, and other people of color. Um, we are here working in the Tucson branch and in the State of Arizona Conference um, on a variety of issues, uh, only one of which is criminal justice. And within criminal justice, we have two primary focuses. Um, one is bail reform, and the other is um, officer-involved shootings and other officer uh, law enforcement use of force. And we have 10 members of the local criminal justice committee in the Tucson branch. We also have a statewide criminal justice committee. Um, and through those committees, we do the work within the organization to promote bail reform. Um, and our uh, 
written document will tell you specifically what we're involved with. Our legislative proposal is something that we hope you'll get behind. If you're not already a member of the NAACP, we hope that you will join not only me, but the elders in this room uh, for whom I have a, a great heart and an indebtedness uh, for the many years that they've devoted to this organization. Um, Donna Liggins, Doris Snowden, uh, Annie Sykes, and our current president, Dr. Sheree Meeks, and there are other members of the NAACP here in this room. And so if you're not already a member, I hope you will go online and uh, you can join us. And I hope to see you at our Criminal Justice Committee uh, next month if you join and you're interested in participating. Thank you. I want to thank our panelists for their time and presence this evening, the audience for you being here today. And I want to thank you both for allowing me the opportunity to facilitate this discussion, which I hope is the first of many to come that ultimately lead to action and change. With that, I will hand it back over to Victor for further thank yous and closing remarks. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to be here tonight. And those of you on Facebook Live, uh, we appreciate you, you know, being here. This has been an educational, informative uh, panel. This is one of the best that we've had. And I uh, would like to commend the audience, commend the panel on the civility that's been demonstrated here and something that can be replicated in the future at other events. And uh, this is the uh, first program for the racial justice program. Uh, long term, we hope to have a center, a brick and mortar center built here uh, down the road, uh, similar to uh, the way the uh, Schomburg began in New York City, uh, pulling together research and, and, and artifacts and developing a relationship with the community, developing a relationship with the universities in the community, and this is uh, one of many programs to come. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Thank you, the uh, YWCA. Thank you, the League of Women Voters. Uh, thank you for all of you that took your time and dedicated it to being here tonight. Please spread the word and encourage people to be involved. Please uh, support these organizations and individuals that are up here. It's very important. Thank you, everyone. Good night. All right.